Now is our time for meditation, so I invite you to get comfortable in your chair, and, and if you'd like, close your eyes. Take some few deep breaths, breathing in and breathing out and relaxing those shoulders. Just let the chair fully support you. This morning, I'm going to invite you to go back in your memory for just a moment and pick a time in your life that you can recall when you were on fire about something, that you were passionate, you were creating something, you were making something, you were causing some action in your life that gave you great joy. Just remember how that felt. The sense of accomplishment that you felt when you were able to do this project and carry it off to fruition. How wonderful that felt. And now think about something that's currently going on in your life. In the present moment. Anything that you would like to see unfold that you're feeling maybe you don't have any control over. Something is going on that doesn't quite make you happy. Now I want you to remember back what it felt like when things were going your way, when everything was wonderful and in sync. And as we go into a brief time of silence, I want you to see your current circumstances like you were back then when you had that laser focus on creating something magnificent. And in the silence, we're going to allow that listening to take place or that inner wisdom and guidance in the silence. When you align with spirit, when you are living your five principles of unity, when you are tuned in, tapped into spirit, and you are listening for that guidance, and you're not forcing your will, but you're allowing God's will through you to bring forth that which your heart desires, there is nothing that you cannot create. We 
We are not victims. We are magnificently powerful, creative beings. And that which your heart desires is what your soul is waiting to help you manifest and create, and be a part of, so that you can live the life that you so choose. So I invite you to travel back to this place and remember what inspired you to follow through and do what you needed to do to create what was in your heart because whatever it is you can recreate it again and you can use that inner wisdom and that guidance to bring forth what it is that you so choose and I guarantee you that if it's something that you're trying to change in someone else that you will get the wisdom for how to change seeing it instead of trying to force something upon someone else you will be guided and directed so I invite you to take time apart and listen and allow spirit to guide you to create that which really resonates in your heart because that's your soul's journey and that's what the universe wants to support you in we're so grateful for these teachings and the way that we can see our lives differently and unfold them in a way that works for us and for everybody around us. And so we say thank you, Indwelling Spirit, for this sweet opportunity to revisit things that we know can work in our lives. Now we bring our focus back into this room with hearts filled with gratitude we say thank you thank you spirit and so it is and so we allow it to be amen whenever you're ready just open your beautiful eyes there's a story in the Lazarus blueprint book we're working on the third chapter and the third step today and there's this lady named Ellen and Ellen is a geriatric nurse in a hospital, and she's on the geriatric ward on that floor, and she absolutely loves the work that she's doing. She's really good at it. But there's a part of her that has this dream about creating her own place where she cares for the elderly, like in a house, in a small setting, she has this dream of being able to do it so personalized and so, you know, putting the personal touch on everything. And then she gets a promotion in the hospital, and they put her in a supervisory role, take her away from the direct care that she is so wonderful at, and she's suddenly miserable in this job because now she's a paper pusher, right? She's a supervisor. She's overseeing all of her friends that she used to work with. She's not a happy camper. She doesn't really like it. And so even more, you know, her dream of being able to do her small care home is just so, so important to her and it becomes more and more of a focus for her. Just about the time that she thinks things couldn't get much worse in the job, she finds this small group that's studying the Lazarus Blueprint. And she starts doing the work. And she does step one, and she sees things like she's never seen before. She moves in to step two, 
And that helps her let go because, you know, it was removing the boulder was last week. So she, it helped her let go of some things. But she said it was step three that rang the bell for her. Because in step three, she got to move into the great expectation, which is what we're talking about today. So this is our third week. Our whole year, we're talking about an inspired life. And we have a, a puzzle. We have a life chart of every aspect of our life. And so this month of March, we're looking at our theme, which is revealing our healing and inner peace. So we're talking about what are the things that we can do that allow us to come into a healthy, whole, well-being kind of life. And so today we're focusing on what does it mean to have great expectations? I can so relate with this woman, Ellen, when I'm reading her story in the book, because I was a geriatric social worker for like 25 years before I came here. And I was looking back and I was thinking about all the things that I did when I was so much younger, but I had all this passion about keeping people out of nursing homes. I was doing things, I was writing grants, I was getting transportation for adult daycare centers, and I was opening places. I had this idea that anything was possible, and it was happening. I actually had one brand new building that I got for $1 a year from the city to open another adult daycare center in another part of town. And when they said, oh, you know, only 2% of the people ever get those federal grants for vehicles, but we got one. We got one to go pick up people and bring them. I mean, thing after thing after thing. And then this registered nurse, this geriatric registered nurse came to me and she said, I have an idea. I want to put services in an apartment building like cafeteria-style menu services. Now, this is before assisted living. This was like in the early 80s, right? So we created this model of like a personal care home. Before it even existed, we, were, we had people in, in a house in two different apartment complexes where we provided activities and grocery shopping. And it was amazing. I look back on all of that, and I thought, you know, what was the driver of all of that? It was that passion, that same passion that this Ellen had about creating something that was better than the institutional model, right? Creating something that was meeting a need in the community. The thing of it was, we believed we could do it. And a lot of people said, nobody's ever done that before. And we said, but you can have an apartment building with older people renting apartments, and then they just contract with us for the services. So it went into this whole uh, opportunity for people to have choice. And many, many people lived there and never went into the nursing home. They lived in their own apartments with their own stuff until they died. It was wonderful. And so I look back and I think, you know, I was so filled with zeal and enthusiasm at that time because I knew it could be done. We believed it, we just did it. So Carolyn Miss, I read this quote uh, the other day. She said, the soul always knows what to do to heal itself. The challenge is to silence the mind. Because you know, we have our mind and then we have our naysayers that agree with the mind, right? Who say we, you know, nobody's ever done that before. Or are you sure you wanna do that at this time in your life? All those kind of things happen to us. So this week, we're still in John 11. We're still talking about the story of Lazarus, but we're only in two verses, 39 through 41, where it says, Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead for four days. And Jesus, what does he say to her? But did I not tell you? Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? That's the kind of faith. That's the kind of faith we're talking about. That's the kind of conviction 
that we're talking about. First, he says, take away the stone. That's what we were talking about last week. Take away the block, the obstacle that keeps you from seeing what it is that needs to happen. In this statement, Jesus makes a denial of the thought about the material conditions that confine life because we're looking in with our five senses, aren't we? It doesn't matter how dire the appearance of, of anything is. I know that some of you have witnessed miracles in your life. We witnessed it in our healing of my husband the first time around when he had stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and they gave him, what, two weeks, you know, right? Complete miraculous healing, 16 additional years. I have seen it. I know that when you change your thinking, you can change your life. Time is not a factor in bodily conditions. When Jesus was told that the body of Lazarus had been dead for four days, his reply was, didn't I tell you that if you believe you would see the glory of God? You see, we are all vessels of that glory. We witness it constantly in nature, in beauty, in love. We witness the glory of God everywhere. It connects us to who we are. It connects us with the divinity within ourselves. It connects us with the allness of God because it is eternal. It is never ending. Jesus represents that Christ consciousness of us that knows that we don't have to depend on the five senses. That knows that there is so much more to us than these physical bodies because we're not just this shell that holds this spirit. We are not our emotions. We're not our feelings. We are spirit. We are huge, huge lights of energy. That part of our Christ consciousness knows at the depth of us that anything is possible. With God, all things are possible. And in this part of the story, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, they're still not really aligned with themselves, with God. They're still not in sync because they're not trusting to follow their divine guidance. Instead of placing their faith in God, they're placing it in this appearance, this momentary appearance of death. So they're stuck in the material world. In order to understand how we experience God's glory, we have to first be willing to distinguish between God's way and our way. Because our ego wants one thing, the Christ in us knows better, right? Always. Our faith is boundless. There are, is no confinement to the faith that we have. We will have all the faith we ever needed. Have you heard people say, I wish I had more faith. Doesn't make sense. You came in with all of the 12 powers ready to assist you. You have everything that you need. It's going to be better for us to invest our faith in God instead of any physical appearances. And whatever facts our five senses gather with our senses and our intellect tries to tell us, you know we make stuff up and then we believe it. We do that all the time. We're judging and making up things because we don't really know how it unfolds. So we just create a story, and then we believe it. And then we judge people for that story that we made up. It's amazing how we do that. But we know from our five unity principles that this particular step, step three, is really about principle three. God is. I am. I think. So what you hold in your mind, what you concentrate on, what you focus on, that's your law of mind action. So where you put your focus is where your faith goes, you see. Are you tunnel visioned on the illness? Or are you focusing on the wholeness and the well-beingness? Where are you putting your faith? because we know how this third principle works. What we think creates feelings, and those feelings create actions. 
This is kind of how we, how we work. So it's important where we place our focus and attention because we attract that which we put our faith in. Wherever that focus is, that's what we draw to us because that's how principle three works. So all the health, the mental health professionals will tell you that our thoughts and our feelings are affected by the fears that we carry around in us. Those things that we have a tendency to fall back on when things aren't quite going exactly like we would like, some of these fears will pop up. So it doesn't make a great deal of sense to spend more time expecting the worst. We need to expect the best, right? Looking for the best and praying for the best outcome. The Jafolas say it takes work to move your faith in the right direction. It requires action, which is our principle five. So we're putting all of our principles into play here because once we have identified what needs to fall away, we need to go into meditation and our prayer time and focus on that so that we can hear and get the guidance that we need. It's our prayer and meditation when we get the information about how to move forward. Then we're directing our faith in the right way. We don't force our will on an issue. We allow spirit to guide us. And then we have faith in our ability to follow that guidance just as Jesus taught us. Mary Alice and Richard Jafola in their book, The Lazarus Blueprint, remember when Jesus asked, didn't I tell you? He's talking about that innate wisdom within us, that intuition that we sometimes foo-foo off like, oh, that can't be, you know. We get intuitive taps all the time to do things, to say things to someone, to pick up the phone, and we go, oh, well, you know, not now. I'll do it later. And we don't follow through, and then later we find out, oh, my gosh, you know, that person made their transition or something happened to them, and we're thinking, oh, I wish I'd picked up the phone when it came to me. You are always guided and always directed all the time. All we have to do is trust that still small voice inside of us for the best solutions to all of our issues. So how do we reflect on this? How do we contemplate this? How do we move forward in a positive way? Well, I have a set of questions. And what's cool about this being on video is you don't have to take notes. You can go back and watch the video and pause it and do the work. All right? So the first question is, what are my five senses trying to tell me? What is it that my intellect is telling me about whatever this issue is that's going on in my life? And whatever that is, then you journal it. You draw it. You write it. You make a list. You do whatever it is that you get from when you ask this question. The second one is, when I look at this list that I made, which of the ones are based in fear or worry or other negative emotions? And then you X all of those out, and hopefully you have some other things that are a little bit more positive that you can focus on, and you can create a new list. However, if you don't, then you have to ask yourself, what do my inner senses reveal about this situation? What does the truth of you know about what is unfolding in your life that you would like to see in a different light? And then you listen, you journal, you draw, because you're paying attention to what spirit is giving you. And then the next question is you ask yourself, where have I been placing my faith? Have I been pointing my faith in the right direction? Or am I wallowing in something? Because, you know, when we do that, we're getting something out of it, too. It's keeping us from moving forward, basically. So where am I placing my faith? And then write those things which are based only on intellect and facts. And then what are three things that I can do to place my faith in God and follow my divine guidance? What are three things that I can do in journal and draw 
And the last one is, what is the very best outcome that can occur with this issue? And this is when you close your eyes and you breathe and you listen and you stay in the stillness until you get those clues and cues for how you can move forward. Even if it doesn't happen in one sitting, you can come back to it and ask again, what is the very best outcome that could possibly come from this? And then you journal it and you draw it and you write it. You see, our, our level of consciousness determines the level of our faith. Only we can choose to change our mindset about something that's going on in our lives. No one else can change it for us. We choose where we direct our faith. So as we learn to point it toward expecting the best, we push beyond the boundaries of our own thoughts and feelings and we move into an expanded consciousness. So when we do that, we're able to see things in a new light. It's sort of like what if upping, Mindy Arlen's what if upping. You don't stay in the level of the problem. You start brainstorming about, well, what if this happened? Or what if that happened? And you start creating these juices in your mind about things that you could do that would make your situation better, at least make you feel better about whatever it is that you're going through. Faith is always going to bump up against its own self-imposed boundaries, but we can move into that expanded consciousness if we do this work. So Ellen, in our opening story, she said that when she was working this third step, she found something on page 83 in the Lazarus Blueprint that was like pure D gold to her. And she said she took this paragraph and she put it in the I statements. And I want to read it to you what she said. These words made all the difference to her when she took them as her own. My positive expectations gather a tremendous energy that draws to me people and circumstances and bodily changes that will support my expectations. To use them over and over and over again. And even after much time had gone by, she said she still gets God bumps when she goes back and reviews that piece of the Lazarus Blueprint and what that step did for her. She's a happy lady. She now has her six-bed facility and it's humming along so nicely. Everybody's doing well. The care is wonderful. The people are happy. Their families are especially happy. She's doing exactly what she said. And she says that it's this step three that got her to that point where she could move forward. She said everything that she dreamed about having that Little facility has come true, and she's one happy lady. Okay, enough preaching. So there's this minister, and he's, uh, he's walking down the sidewalk in front of his church. He's one of those guys that has a, a collar on, and he's walking down, and he hears the sort of semblance of prayer words going on, and he looks over, and he says, the little words were like, making his collar wilt. So he walks over and realizes that it's his five-year-old son and his friends who have discovered a dead robin. And so what they have done is they found a little box and they filled it full of cotton batting and they put the little bird in there. And so they elected, since he was the preacher's kid, that he needed to say the prayer. So this is what he came upon, was his son praying for this bird in this way as what he thought his father would say. Glory be unto the Father. Glory be unto the Son. And glory into the hole he goes. <laughs> Close. It was very close. 
<laughs> Holy Ghost was, yeah, very close. I ran across this, um, this quotation. Somebody just now got it. <laughs> A little delayed reaction there. Um, I ran across this, and I thought it was a good way to end today's session. It's called encouragement. And it said, if no one else encourages you, encourage yourself. If no one else believes in you, believe in yourself. Only you have the power to change your life. It doesn't matter what other people say or think or whether or not they can see your vision. It's up to not up to others to keep you motivated. That's your job. So treat yourself with loving kindness and encouragement and never doubt for a minute that you can do whatever you set your mind to. So I encourage you all to have great expectations for your life. And so it is. Thank you. Now we have an opportunity to give back into our community, so I invite you to, to take your tithes and gifts in your hands, and if you give online, use the little card and bless it that's in your seat back pocket. If you're giving through PayPal or Breeze, we thank you in advance for doing it that way. Together, divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive Thank you, God, that this is so. And so it is. Namaste.